Welcome inside the Quinnipiac Bobcats Sports Network Roundtable for the Quinnipiac men's ice hockey team. My name is Jack Maine. Alongside me today is QBSN online editor Kalen Terry and hockey beat reporters Gage Kilborn and Aiden Barrett. Guys, it was an exciting season, an excited abbreviated season for the Quinnipiac men's ice hockey team as they were crowned ECAC champions, technically back-to-back as they were unable to complete the 2019-2020 season, and they got a berth in the Western Semi-Regional Finals of the NCAA Tournament. However, they were they fell short in their quest for a national championship, and one player that will not be around to help lead Quinnipiac to that quest is Odin Tufto, the reigning ECAC Player of the Year, has graduated. Who is going to step up and fill that void? Kalen, we'll start with you. Uh, so obviously Tufto left a lot of big shoes to fill. There are a couple of people that I think could fill these shoes. There's three first years that come to mind who had a killer first season so far with the Bobcats. You've got Avari Rasnan, Ty Smolonic, and Christoph Filion who could fill this void as first years like moving up to sophomores now. Uh, when it comes to these upperclassmen, you've got Wyatt Bongiovanni, Skylar Brindamore, Ethan DeYoung. They all can kind of fill these spots here. I kind of want to see what the other guys think, but these are the, the top people that I think are going to be able to fill those shoes so far. Yeah, going off what you said, I think the answer is kind of clear. It's Wyatt Bongiovanni for me because he's going to be the captain next year for the 2020-2021-22 season. And last season, he did not play to he did not play all the games because he had an injury in December 26th against AIC where we did not see him again until March when the tournament began, the NCAA tournament. And I, he, had, he did a great job. He scored eight points in this nine games that he was able to participate in. So I think if, he, if anybody's, I'll be Wyatt Bongiovanni because he's going to be the captain next year and he has really big shoes to fill um, coming off of Odin Tufto's historic season last year. You know, I don't think you replace Odin Tufto. I think what you got to do is you got to change up your system, okay? The Bobcats scored 100 goals last year, good enough for seventh in the nation. Odin Tufto impacted on 48 of those, and that was just on the stat sheet. Eight goals, 39 assists. Okay, so you got to look who else can step in there but not take up his role, okay? We have Ethan Day Chong, who finished – Top 20 in scoring in the nation. You put in Y Don Giovanni. You know, he had eight points, nine games. He only played nine games. He's going to come back. Ty Smolonic and Bon Giovanni both finished top 10 in power play goals. So there are pieces there, but you don't go in and you go like, hey, how can we replace 48 points or 47 points? My apologies. I mean, I don't think that's really possible. That's just such a big ask out of these guys, but you can still come together. And if you get this group going, I mean, Christophe de Leon, he had a nice season, six goals. And I think a big year could come out of Gus Van Ness, two goals, 13 assists. They have some playmakers. They have some young players who can take a bigger step, another bigger role in this system. But I don't think you can really replace a player like an Odin Tapta. Well, Quinnipiac's all-time leader in points looks elsewhere to continue his hockey career. One person that both Kalen and Aiden alluded to, Ty Smolonic, could surpass him in career points but had an amazing rookie year with the Bobcats. He was the co-ECAC leader in goals scored, along with his teammate Ethan DeYoung. But what do we expect from Ty in his second year? Will he have a sophomore slump, or will he have his second year boom? I'll I'll start off on this one. Um, He had a tremendous first year. We can't take that away from him. And he kind of was... No, it was like the second leader of the team, really. I felt like he was up there with Odin Tufto. It wasn't Odin Tufto score on the scorecard. It was Ty Smolonic. Those two were a great power duo up there on the front line. And I think this, the upcoming season, I don't think he'll, I think it'll be a sophomore slump for him because the big reason, the big reason I'm kind of nervous about this upcoming year is the teams are going to play. If you think, if you look at the schedule last season, they played LIU a bunch of times. They played against Sacred Heart. And they play against Colgate and all these teams that were beatable, pretty beatable. The only team that that was giving a tough run at it, of course, is Clarkson. This year, they have Cornell back. All these Ivy League schools are coming back. And Ty Smolonic has never faced them before. So he's kind of unfamiliar in their territory. And when they go back into into either Cornell or to any of these big, big name or hockey arenas, I think that he's going to be, this is going to be when we find out if he has a pressure to, if he's able to come through with it and 
prove himself or he'll, he'll fall apart. And I think he'll have a, I think he'll fall apart a little bit. From a production standpoint, I could see a dip. From a play standpoint, I highly doubt. Okay, Tyson Milanic is a highly touted prospect, drafted by the Florida Panthers in the third round. Um, he's got the skill. It was obvious last year. He scored 14 goals, but he did have Odin Tufto right next to him, which we said earlier. This year, he's probably going to be playing on a line with Y. Bon Giovanni and Ethan Dechong. I think I could still see him hovering right around that 15 goal mark. And you know what? He's going to be a leader. He's going to have another top six role on this Quinnipiac Bobcats team, unless something else happens, but I don't see that happening. So I think he's still a top six role on this team. You know, he's great on the power play. He finished top 10 in the nation in power play goals as a freshman. I mean, the guy can put the puck in the back of the net. So I don't think that it's going to change this year that he can't put the puck in the back of the net. You know, we saw it. He was all over the place. I mean, he's one of the skilled, if not the most skilled player on this Bobcats team and probably is the most skilled player on this team. So I see another 15 goal mark around for uh, Ty Smolani because he just kept getting better as the year went on. So I think you can really see him, you know, take that next step and really carry some of this offense for the Bobcats this year. Maybe be the leading goal scorer. We'll see though. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to have to disagree with you too, Gage. I think he's going to have another second year boom. I think he's going to do fairly the same as he did this past year. Obviously, he was the one of the top high scoring players for the Bobcats. And I know that we've kind of been comparing him with Tufto because, you know, they do have to fill that spot. And, you know, I'm going to kind of take it that way a little bit too. Arguably, when it comes to goal wise, he did play better than Tufto when it comes to goals. Assist-wise, not so much. They are two completely different players on the ice. Uh, Smolonic is more goal-oriented, where Tufto is better at passing the puck to get the shots into the goal. So you're right, Aiden, when you said that they worked better together. Now that Tufto is leaving, I guess we'll have to see how that goes with Smolonic. But I think that he will you know, have a second year boom as he was one of the highest scoring players. We also do need to look, as Gage had said, about these Ivy Leagues coming in. Although with COVID and everything still going on, it's not completely certain that we will have that entire full overall schedule of, you know, 34 some games, but it will be a challenge for Smolonic to go against these Ivy Leagues that he hasn't played yet or seen yet. So I do think he'll have a second year boom. May not be as, you know, 14 goals. He might pull a tough dough where a tough dough last year had 15 goals, 17 assists, and then this year went down to eight. I think it might be similar in that aspect where he went 14 goals this year, but Smolonic may drop down to eight or nine, maybe even 10 goals, but I still think he'll be a top scorer for the Bobcats. Over the past six or so years, the Bobcats have had two of the best goaltenders in the nation going from Andrew Shortridge to Keith Petrozelli. Now that Petrozelli has graduated and moved on to the NHL, there is a question mark looming over the Bobcat net. There are two goaltenders on the roster right now as it stands is going to be one of those two guys or will the Bobcats bring in an outsider? Kaylin, we'll start with you again. Uh, so I know that the other two guys are going to say somebody completely different, but I will have to say with the two Bobcat goalies we have right now after uh, Petrozelli and uh, Mayana is going to leave, uh, I would say that Yaniv Peretz the first year will be the starting goalie for the Bobcats pending whoever transfers or incomes uh, in the new recruits that the team will get to be announced in the future. But I do believe Yanni's, Yanni Peretz will be the starting goaltender for the Bobcats. Uh, this past year alone in his first year, he only played two games. He played about 15 minutes in both, but they went 9-0 against Colgate with five saves he had in that game. And then 7-1 against LIU where he had four saves. If you're looking at Evan Peer, uh, Evan Fear, excuse me, uh, he only had seven minutes of play throughout this whole year. He played a lot more back in his first year, but this year he did not play much at all. We barely saw him. He only had two saves in those seven minutes. So looking at that wise, I think that Yanni Pretz will be the starting goaltender for the Bobcats. You know, I would be shocked if they don't start with uh, Dylan St. Cyr game one of the season. Okay, this guy's from Notre Dame. He held a 921 save percentage. And had an 11 9 1 record at Notre Dame. Um, the guy is great. I mean, he's five foot nine and uh, he's a super aggressive, athletic goaltender. His positioning is outstanding. You watch it, he jumps off the tape. Positioning, great. You know, put in perspective, Keith Petrozelli is six foot five. So his positioning, his aggressiveness would have to be great. Otherwise, he's not going to succeed. He played under the great Jeff Jackson at Notre Dame. 
and he thrived under that system. You know, his season defining moment last year, he had two straight shutouts against Michigan State. That's not a small school. And then he made 38 saves against Ohio State in a 5 2 win. You know, he knows he's been in the big moments and he can thrive in them. And he's from, you know, a hockey family. His mom is the only woman goaltender to ever play in the NHL. The only woman to ever play in the NHL is his mom. She had seven saves to the Tampa Bay Lightning. His dad, sorry, my apologies. His uncle had a stint with the St. Louis Blues and the New Jersey Devils. So, you know what? I think Dylan St. Cyr will be the starter. You know, he played in the U.S. National Developmental Team. He had a 900 save percentage, played with guys like Quinn Hughes and Brady Kachuk. He just always played at the highest level. I'd be shocked if they don't go with Dylan St. Cyr game one of the season. I'm on the same page as you are, Aiden. And something else that you didn't mention was his first year in Notre Dame, they went to the national championship game and lost to Minnesota Duluth. So he has a championship caliber that I think that Rand Pecknell is looking for. And as we all know going in, that Rand Pecknell has been trying hard to bring a national championship to Hamden. He's come up short in two of times, in 2013 and in 16. And another thing to take a look at is the Big Ten Conference is, of, is starting to build up as a strong powerhouse in hockey. We're used to hearing about the Hockey East being the big one and the NCHC out, in, out West been some of the bigger hockey programs in the country. But now it's going to turn to the Big Ten and the ECAC. The Big Ten is starting to produce amazing teams, such as Penn State is coming out in their new year. Ohio State, another one. Notre Dame, like we mentioned. And with the competitiveness of the Big Ten, especially last season, I think that's going to help. I think it's going to help motivate him, especially when he gets to this next level when he's under Rand Pecknell. So I, I'm on the same page with you. It should definitely be Dylan St. Cyr in, in the crease to start the season. Definitely a topic that will be debated until the puck is dropped on the new season. Looking at the big picture now, Quinnipiac, we saw them play in a semifinal game this past year. They got there with a little bit of luck but maybe only because there were four total teams that competed in the ECAC, as we alluded to earlier in the round table. So assuming that every team is back in the upcoming season, will this benefit or hurt Quinnipiac? You know, I don't think it's going to hurt or help them because, you know, we don't know what the teams are going to look like. They haven't played in two years, you know, two years ago, Cornell finished at the top of the standings. But you know what? The rosters are completely different now. But I still think Quinnipiac is going to be very competitive because they always are pretty competitive. You know, they finished top three two years ago. Last year, they were against St. Lawrence. And, you know, they were the best regular season team by a country mile. Got, you know, unfortunately, they lost St. Lawrence. And then they had trouble in the, in the uh, NCAA tournament. But you know what? They're still a top team. So I think that, you know, bringing in some of these guys and you know what? I think we're going to see a big year from some of these younger Bobcats who can come in and play a big role for them. Um, I think they're going to be very competitive. I think they'll be right at the top. And I think they're going to at least compete for another ACAC championship. We'll see if they get into the tournament. But yeah, I think they're going to be a very good competitive team this year. Yeah, it's kind of like how we were talking about Smolotic not knowing how these Ivy Leagues play because they ha like he hasn't seen them. These first years haven't seen them. I agree with you, Aiden. It's hard to say. I think that it may hurt them a little bit as these first years and these incoming players have not seen any of these teams. They've only seen the conference teams as they played them this year. They didn't see much of them last year or the year prior either. So it's it's really hard to say, but I do think that it possibly may hurt the teams and we'll just, we'll have to see when puck drop comes in the first game of the season. But I, I think it's going to be interesting to see how they'll play against these teams that they haven't seen in a year and just see where they go from there. Okay. So I see you two are on the fence. So I kind of have an answer for this one. I understand your points are perfectly clear that they're unfamiliar with this unfamiliar territory for them. And that's kind of why I'm saying that's going to be a struggle for them this season because there's more teams involved than just four. And so we won't be seeing that many, as many awards as we saw this past season, where every other week, some player from Quinnipiac was earning an award for just scoring a goal or making amazing saves and that sort of thing. So it's going to be more, it's going to be more, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult for them to try to be at the top like they were last season. And like Jack said, they had a little bit of luck actually since Clarkson opted out because of COVID complications. So Quinnipiac ended up making it to an ECAC championship game without playing a single game. So I don't, it's going to be 
not much luck based. So they have to stay there to learn to play well. And I think that's going to be where they'll be struggling the most. And when the Ivy League teams get going after the after they play after the non-conference schedule, I think they should probably watch out because they're going to be hungry for some blood. Well, there are currently 20 games on the 2021-2022 schedule. They are subject to change, and they are all ECAC games. All ECAC opponents are on the schedule. So, assuming the 20-game schedule sticks, which we know there will be out-of-conference games added, what do you guys think Quinnipiac's overall in-conference record will be one at a time? Aiden, go ahead. Well, I mean, two years ago, they went 14, 6, and 2. So I think they'll hover right around there. I think they can get 13 to 15 wins. Uh, yeah, I pretty much said the same thing. I said 13, 5, and 2. Uh, again, I think that they have the team to do it. Uh, so I think that they'll be able to reach that in conference play. Yeah, I'm similar with you guys. I'm 14, and 5, and 1, just a little bit off of what Kaylin said. And I think there's a good chance they might make the tournament this year. There you guys have it, Quinnipiac staying in the thick of it with the best that the ECAC has to offer. Definitely going to be an exciting season to watch. Be sure to stick with us here at theqbsn.com for all of your off-season Quinnipiac content.